Again, thank you to our distinguished guests, Congressman Liu and Congressman Waters, for being with us today. We also have quite a few other uh, local elected officials and other distinguished guests I'd like to recognize, and I would just ask that you hold your applause until the end of the list of introductions. Heidi Ashcraft, these are Torrance City Council members, Heidi Ashcraft, Tim Goodrich, Jeff Rizzo, and then uh, Torrance City Clerk, Rebecca Poirier, Torrance City Manager, Leroy Jackson, from the Fire Department, Chief Martin Serna, former Torrance Mayor Dee Hardison, former Torrance City Council member Bill Applegate, former Torrance City Council member Tom Brewer, uh, former City Council member Rolling Hills Estates, Britt Huff, uh, Martha Deutsch of the Torrance Unified School District Board of Education, also Terry Reagans from the School Board in Torrance, Michael Wormers from the Torrance School Board, and Dr. George Mannon, uh, Superintendent of the Torrance Unified uh, School District, uh, Katie Crumpy, Ch Chief Academic Officer at the School District in Torrance, also Rob Catherman from the Water Replenishment District, Susie Siemens, who is the former mayor of Rolling Hills Estates, and Sue Herbers, former City of Torrance City Clerk, City of Torrance Clerk. Join me in, in uh, applauding and uh, thanking them for being here with us today. I'd also ask all the current uh, members of the board to stand when I read your name. John Heffernan, AT&T, Laurie Brandt, Red Car Brewery and Rus Restaurant, Kirk Rosberg from the Torrance Bakery, Jack Folkert, UCLA Health, Leslie Willie, Kaiser Permanente, Rob Van Lingen, Van Lingen Towing, Jeff Dill from PBF Energy, Alexandra Warnier from Honda, Jennifer Fru, Green Hills Memorial Park, Linda Amato, Doubletree, Tim Thompson, Centarius Financial, Marianne Brooks, Gourmet Grinds, Ellen Mary Michelle, Pelican Products, Latrice McLaughlin, Connecta Federal Credit Union, Joe Ahn of Northrop Grumman, Chris Cagle from the South Bay Workforce Investment Board, Josh Thomas of South Bay Equity, and uh, I just want to say those who are standing, I want to thank you guys for serving on the Board of Directors. It's, it's really a, a huge honor for me to be able to serve uh, in this capacity with all of your support and all the work. So please uh, join me in recognizing them and their efforts to make the Chamber happen. Thank you so much. I also want to recognize uh, a few former chairs of the board of the chamber that are here. Aaron Alcides, uh, Jack Folkert, Clifton L. Johnson, Dan Keaton, Sherry Kramer, and Tara O'Brien. You may stand if you'd like and we'll recognize you as well. Thank you for being here. And just briefly before we get to the, the meat of the event, um, on, on your table you'll find a placard with today's social media information. And I would just, just think, it looks like this, it's a small gray sheet. Just take a look at that and we'd encourage you to post and share with friends, letting folks know about today's event and all the great things that we're learning and enjoying here today with, with the appropriate hashtags, of course. Um, I now want to uh, invite, excuse me, I want to invite Leslie Willie, who is Senior Vice President and Area Manager for Kaiser Permanente South Bay Medical Center to the stage, and she will be introducing our, today's first speaker. Thank you so much, Jonathan. So it's, gosh, it's my privilege and honor um, uh, to this afternoon to introduce Congressman Ted Liu here today and actually I had just the wonderful pleasure of meeting his right hand Betty um, at our table today so I wanted to acknowledge her because I know that you are such a support um, to Mr. Liu. So um, Congressman Liu's district reaches along the coast from Malibu through Palace Verdes including beautiful beaches, world class universities and guess what else, some incredible, incredible hospitals. <laughs> Kaiser Permanente is just one of them. So prior to representing us in Washington, D.C., Congressman Liu served in the California State Legislature and here in Torrance on the City Council. In addition to serving as an elected official, he has also served our nation in the United States Air Force and in the Reserves. Thank you. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. We are so fortunate to have him in Congress advocating for issues of, of the utmost importance to all of us, some of which include cybersecurity. We've heard a lot about that. 
ending veteran homelessness and, of course, we've also heard a lot about making health care affordable in this country, a critical issue. So please give me a, join me in welcoming Congressman Ted Liu to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is uh, such a great honor for me to be here. I want to thank Jonathan Butler and the whole Torrance uh, Chamber Area of Commerce Board for their wonderful leadership for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's an honor here to be with Congresswoman Maxine Waters to serve with her in Congress. She, uh, as you may know, is a ranking member on the Financial Services Committee. She's been fighting the good fight for America for a very long time. Let's give her a great big round of applause. And I want to thank my wife, Betty, for being with me here. Uh, without her, nothing could be done. So. And very excited, we have uh, members of Torrance City Council here. I want to thank the council and their staff for making this city so great. It's one reason Betty and I choose to make Torrance our hometown. I want to give a shout out to uh, police and fire. And as you know, Torrance is one of the few cities that still has a class one rated fire department. So congratulations. <laughs> And then to the members of uh, the Torrance School Board of Education and your staff, thanks for the amazing work uh, that you do. It's one reason that Betty and I choose to send our two children uh, to Torrance Unified Schools. So thank you for making a great school district. Okay. And uh, I love coming to a Torrance Area Chamber of Commerce events. I will always have a special place in my heart for you. Uh, it was where I first got started in the community. Uh, in 1999, I went through the leadership Torrance class, and then in 2000, I did one of the hardest things in my life, which was I ran the leadership Torrance class. Uh, and so very excited to see that I uh, didn't kill it, and it's still going strong, and uh, congratulations on that, that great program. So I thought I'd talk to you today about three subjects. Uh, the first is uh, the state of the economy. Second is going to be on your health insurance. And then third, I'm going to talk about cybersecurity. So in terms of the economy, I thought it might be helpful to think about where we've been in the last eight years. Uh, today is President Barack Obama's last full day in office. And eight years ago, our unemployment nationally was at 10%. Uh, last month, it dropped down to a low of 4.7%. Uh, in the state of California eight years ago, unemployment hit 12.1%. As of last month, it went down to 5.3%. And in LA County, uh, we had a, a similar uh, reduction in uh, unemployment from 12.4%. Um, eight years ago to less than uh, 5% uh, as of last month. And in the South Bay, we continue to be an engine of economic growth. Uh, for LA County in 2015, South Bay created over 12,700 uh, net new jobs, and it is an amazing uh, district to be able to represent. At the same time, if you look at the stock market, eight years ago in March, it hit a low of 6,443. Today, as we stand here, the stock market is three times higher. That is an amazing surge uh, in just eight years. And yet, there is a lot of anger in different parts of America. And so it took me a while to uh, understand this because uh, I probably represent one of the least angry districts uh, in America. <laughs> uh, but I think it's um, clear that the economy did not work for everyone. And there were uh, parts of America did not see the same benefits of the economy that other parts did. Uh, there were states that clearly did less well than California did in terms of coming uh, out of the recession. Uh, you have coal miners that are having a very difficult time uh, in coal mining country. And that's not because of governmental policies or simply because of the marketplace. You had cheaper forms of energy uh, basically start to wipe out the coal industry. And that's simply a very difficult problem uh, to resolve. Uh, you have uh, areas of America where automation uh, took a huge and big blow uh, to their economy. Uh, the same 
uh, factory that makes automobiles today needs a lot less human beings than the same factory 30 years ago because of robots and of automation. If you look at Amazon.com, there was this startling statistic I read. In 2013, they had 1,000 robots. Last year, they had 45,000 robots. And it's not just that they displaced potentially 44,000 jobs, because these robots are more efficient on average than human beings. We're talking about orders of magnitude uh, in terms of job displacement. So these are difficult issues, and it's something that's really hard to fix unless we look at the right solutions. Blaming minorities and immigrants uh, are not the right solutions to that because it's going to turn out that that's not the cause of job loss. A lot of job loss is because of automation. It's because of wage differentials in other countries. Uh, you can't fix that uh, even if you did build a wall and made pe Mexico pay for it. So what do we need to do? Well, if I could, if I was king for a day, I would make every single school district across America, whether it's in rural Pennsylvania, uh, or in the South Bay, or in Detroit, Michigan, teach computer science. As a member of the House Budget Committee last term, I authored an amendment that the Obama administration had proposed that was going to give $3 billion in funding to school districts across America uh, so that they can train teachers in school districts to start teaching computer science uh, to our students in high school. That unfortunately did not pass, but we're going to keep trying and try again because we cannot stop innovation, uh, nor should we. But we can teach our children and retrain adults to make sure that they're poised to take advantages of the 21st century. So let me sort of move to uh, health care, and you've been reading about it uh, in the news. Uh, our Republican colleagues last week chose to repeal the Affordable Care Act without a plan. You don't have to be partisan to understand that that was just a really stupid thing to do. Um, I am on the Affordable Care Act because they make members of Congress purchase Obamacare if you want it to have health insurance. I was not allowed to purchase other forms of health insurance. So I am very supportive of fixing the ACA. There are lots of things I would do to fix it. But repealing it without a plan makes no sense because you don't know if this next plan is going to be better or worse. So why would you repeal something without even knowing what the alternative plan is? And what I want to speak to, uh, although the ACA did do amazing things for about 20 million people, gave them health insurance they never had before, I want to talk to the 156 million Americans who have employer-based health coverage. That is most of you in this room. There were amazing things that the Affordable Care Act did for your health coverage. It eliminated lifetime maximum caps on your health insurance. It also said people cannot be denied for pre-existing conditions, and it let folks who are up to age 26 be on their parents' health plan. So what does that mean? That means if you've got cancer on your employer-based health coverage, and it is a kind of cancer that requires a lot of money to treat, under the ACA, the health insurance company can't say, we're just going to stop providing treatment. If you repeal it, that's what's going to happen. Those on employer-based health coverage, the 156 million Americans, if they or their family members have cancer and it blows past a uh, lifetime maximum, then you stop getting treated and you're going to have to either file for bankruptcy or find another way to pay for that cancer treatment. If you are a 23-year-old who has a pre-existing condition, whether it's diabetes uh, or cancer or, or something else, <clears throat> you currently can go on your parents' employer-based health coverage plan. If you repeal the ACA, that also goes away. So there are huge effects, uh, not just for the 20 million people who buy insurance off exchanges, for all of you, for people who have employer-based health coverage, because the ACA addressed both groups of folks. And I do look forward to the plan that will come forth at some point. Now keep in mind, Republicans have had six years to come up with a plan. And to me, there's a pretty simple reason why we have not seen an alternative plan yet. I can sum it up uh, in one word, math. You cannot keep all the great parts of the Affordable Care Act and not pay for it. So you can't require insurance companies 
to not have lifetime coverage caps, make insurance companies not deny people for pre-existing conditions, let insurance companies force them to carry people who are uh, 26 years uh, or younger on their parents' plan without helping these insurance companies pay for that coverage. And what happens when you repeal it uh, without a plan is you need to find other sources of funding. For six years, no one was able to find a better source of funding than that set forth in the Affordable Care Act. So now we're seeing proposals being introduced in Congress uh, to either cut Social Security or to privatize Medicare. And I just have to say, those are really bad sources of funding uh, for the Affordable Care Act. So I do look forward to see uh, if there is an alternative plan. Uh, but if there is not, then we're going to have to put a lot of pressure to say, look, let's not repeal this thing until you can find a better plan. And as President Obama said in his speech last week, if folks can come up with a better plan uh, that controls health care costs, covers about the same amount of people, and provides the same or better health coverage, then he's going to support it. And I will support it as well. So far, we have not seen it. So um, our hope is that the American people understand that you can't just repeal something if you don't have something better uh, to put in its place. So now I'm going to transition to uh, cybersecurity for the rest of my speech. And the goal of this part of the speech uh, is to scare you. I want you to understand how easy it is for you to get hacked. And I want you to start thinking about how you can protect yourself. Uh, so last year, uh, 60 Minutes called my office and they went to my staff and they said, hey, we want to hack your boss's cell phone. And my staff said, of course, go right ahead. Uh, <laughs> It was a little more complicated that uh, 60 Minutes didn't want to mess up my personal cell phone. So what they did is they went ahead, uh, bought an Apple iPhone uh, at a store, uh, gave it to me. I opened up the box. I took the phone. And they said, keep it uh, for about a week. And we're going to try and hack it. So I kept it. I was in Washington, DC. I was here in the South Bay. I went back for my interview. I was 60 Minutes. First thing they did is they played back recordings I had of phone conversations between me and my staff and me and other people uh, from this cell phone. They showed every place I had traveled with this phone and they showed text messages that were sent and acquired. Uh, that was really quite creepy and disturbing. And it is a flaw known as the signaling system number seven flaw. People speak of it as SS7. Uh, so if you just Google SS7, all sorts of articles will pop up. And the way this flaw works is that um, many, many decades ago, when we set up our telephone networks, we assumed that every telephone network was what was known as a trusted entity, a trusted network. So let's say you're making a call to Africa, right? Your USA network might you know, hand off to some network in the Middle East that then hands off to an African telephone network. Well, it turns out that some of these trusted networks are owned by countries such as Iran, North Korea, Russia, as well as criminal syndicates associated with these nations. So if you just had access to one of these telephone networks, you can listen in on anybody's cell phone in real time just knowing their cell phone number. So right now, for example, you can have Russians listening in on your cell phone if they knew your cell phone number uh, in real time. And it is a difficult problem to fix. So two days after 60 Minutes ran their um, episode, the Federal Communications Commission launched an investigation. They're looking at ways to fix it. Uh, committees in Congress are looking at ways to fix it. Uh, and, and it is difficult. Uh, there is something you can do to protect yourself, which is you can go to encryption. Uh, there are a number of telephone apps that you can download that will encrypt your text messages as well as encrypt your voice messages. Uh, for example, one of these applications is known as WhatsApp. It is owned by Facebook. You've got other applications known as Signal or Telephone. And if you use those applications, then whatever you send out through your phone or receive will be encrypted. The difficulty is you've got to get the other person on the other line to use that same app. Uh, so it is difficult to, to get there, but I'm trying to get more and more people to do this. So with my own staff, uh, we're starting to communicate uh, on, on WhatsApp. Now, there are simpler ways for your phones to get hacked 
other than from a foreign government or criminal syndicate, right? So that's probably not a high percentage probability uh, that your phone will get hacked that way. But there is a massive probability your phone will get hacked simply from criminal hackers. And one of the easiest ways is through public Wi-Fi. My advice is I would almost never sign on to public Wi-Fi if I were you, unless you are very, very sure that that's a secure Wi-Fi system. So let's say you're at LAX airport. Would you know if the Wi-Fi you signed on to, if the correct one was LAX or LAX1 or LAX underscore one? Because if you click on the wrong one and it happens to be from the hacker sitting 20 feet away from you who's sending out this LAX underscore one Wi-Fi that's fake, then everybody that signs on to that, he has their personal information uh, within seconds. It is something known as spoofing. It is incredibly easy uh, for hackers to do. Some of you have your phone set up to log on to Wi-Fi uh, automatically, which means you can walk by a Starbucks. Your phone can log on to a fake Wi-Fi system, and then you've just lost all the contents of your information to a hacker without even knowing it. Uh, so if I were you, I would also disable on your phones the automatic logging on to Wi-Fi feature. Uh, again, you can go to encryption to, to mitigate some of that, uh, but if you log on to a wrong Wi-Fi um, network, uh, you're going to have, uh, you're going to basically become the, the victim of identity theft, uh, and you're going to have uh, problems uh, from hackers getting, uh, getting your information. Something else you may want to think about, uh, many of you, like me, like Congresswoman Waters and others, we will work on our cell phones, right? We have a desktop in our office, and then when uh, we leave the office, we'll send emails through our cell phones. The problem is you've got lots of um, CIOs. So at the federal level, you've got a uh, House of Representatives uh, CIO, uh, Chief Information Officer, who spends an incredible amount of money and resources protecting our desktops. You've got uh, companies that spend a huge amount of money protecting the desktops at your workplace. But they do nothing to protect your mobile device, your mobile phone, that is connected to that desktop. And that's highly troubling because cybersecurity is only as strong as your weakest link, and your mobile phone is gonna be that weakest link. So what that means is the huge amount of money at the House of Representatives that we spend protecting our desktops and our servers are being attacked, <clears throat> Hackers would just go, oh, well, let me just go try and hack a members of Congress cell phone because there's nothing that protects it. And once they hack it, then they become me, right? Then the emails that get sent through our secure server that come from me, people will assume it is from me. And for a period of time, those fake emails can get a lot of information because if I send an email to somebody asking for information, they're gonna respond to me because they think it's me. But if it's a hacker, then all of a sudden, all the information goes to this hacker and you have these huge vulnerabilities in, in our systems. Uh, this led Congressman William Hurd, a Republican out of Texas, who also has a computer science degree, um, we're actually two of the four members of Congress that have computer science degrees, to send a letter last year to uh, all our staff and all members of Congress to say, look, here are some steps to try to secure your cell phones, because this is a, a huge problem. We had an oversight hearing last year no, actually it was uh, last month, where we had federal agencies and their uh, chief information officers. And I asked a series of questions which went like this. Uh, do you all have cell phones connected uh, to your uh, private servers, or, I'm sorry, public servers, and do you protect them? So some federal agencies actually took the policy position, which I think is a good one. They simply said, we are not connecting anybody's mobile device. Uh, to uh, our uh, governmental systems, unless it's from a governmental cell phone that we protect and we issue. Other federal agencies took the position, and this one person, she's, she was a CIO of this agency that I'm not going to name, and she basically said, I don't view mobile devices, or personal mobile devices, as my responsibility. She felt so bad about that statement <laughs> that a couple days later she actually called my office back and said, I just want to clarify uh, that statement. Uh, so I think we're making some inroads in trying to get federal agencies to understand that when you connect mobile devices, whether it's governmental or personal, into the governmental network, it is a vulnerability. And the same resources you, you spend to protect 
the governmental desktop and server, you need to spend protecting that cell phone. <clears throat> so sort of taking a step back, right? There has been massive cyber attacks, not just at the federal government, but also in the private sector. You've had Anthem Blue Cross, Home Depot, Target, the list goes on in terms of companies that have been breached uh, from cyber attacks. And some of these attacks, again, right, it, it, hackers figure out the, the weakest point of vulnerability. So in the Target attack, the way they actually went in and got everybody's credit cards it was through a subcontractor who worked on the HVAC system. So let's just think about that, right? Target could have done everything they could, but because this subcontractor on the HVAC system had a, a weakness, it was exploited. Um, let me go back to federal government again. Uh, two years ago, articles came back that said our CIA director's AOL email account got hacked. My first thought was, why is he still on AOL? But um, <laughs> beyond that, uh, um, the way that hack happened is hackers um, posed as, as Verizon employees, then tricked some legitimate Verizon employees to give up information about his account. And then through that, they were able to uh, hack on his AOL account. So you actually had another company that had a cybersecurity weakness that affected AOL uh, and the CIA director. So we need to upgrade uh, cybersecurity across both the federal uh, as well as private sectors, and that's going to take two things. One, it's just going to take straight up money, right? We just need to um, upgrade these systems. Uh, on the oversight committee last year, we had these hearings where these federal agencies would say, you know, that their mainframes were being run still on languages like COBOL, which, you know, two decades ago, people were saying, wow, this is really out of date. Um, and it was never designed to withstand 21st century uh, cyber attacks. Uh, so on the budget committee, I also authored uh, an amendment of over $3 billion to, to provide a revolving fund for federal agencies to be able to upgrade uh, uh, their uh, computer systems. It didn't pass a budget committee, uh, but it did result in legislation that I co-authored, uh, again with uh, Republican Congressman William Hurd, that now, through legislation, is going to give uh, these federal agencies a, a pot of money, over $3 billion, to access as a revolving fund to upgrade uh, their systems. But the second thing that needs to happen is we need human beings uh, to change their view uh, on cybersecurity. The NSA, for example, is one of the, probably the most well-protected uh, governmental system in the world. We know a lot about the NSA now, right? Because a human being sort of went off the reservation and disclosed a lot about it. So you've got that problem you need to resolve. But most of the time, it's not because a human employee is doing something nefarious or insidious. It's because they don't know that the link they just clicked on uh, was a spear phishing attack that, that caused malware to be installed uh, on their system. Uh, so the, the US military has been onto this for quite a while. And uh, well over a decade ago, uh, the US military set up US Cyber Command. When I go up and do my Air Force Reserve duty, uh, I've got to certify annually my cybersecurity training. If I don't, they kick me off the system. Um, I've got to do refresher courses. There are units within the Air Force who sold jobs to try to trick me and other people to do incorrect things uh, on the email and so on, and they tell you what you did was wrong. Uh, so the US military is just harder to hack. But most civilian agencies, most folks in private sector don't do that. They don't do that sort of training. They do very little to teach their employees uh, cyber security practices. And if you don't do that, it just takes one employee, right, in, in a large company to make a mistake and then a hacker can get in and start trying to get information. So uh, it's referred to basically as social engineering and I think we need to be much more aware of what hackers do to try to get that information. If you look at uh, the breaches that happened uh, with John Podesta and the Hillary Clinton campaign, uh, it wasn't because they you know, were able to do this clandestine investigation and loaded in malware. Uh, if you read the public reports, it's because he clicked on an email link uh, that was malware and, and it stalled on the system and wham, all the information uh, got disclosed. Uh, so for those of you in the private sector, uh, I just want you to be much more aware uh, of how easy it is to get hacked. 
and let me conclude on this, um, on Cyprus Q, on this last point. There are now profit incentives for hackers to go after you, and it's called ransomware. So it started with hospitals. Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital in Southern California was hacked last year, and what they did is the hackers locked up all of the medical records, and then they said to the hospital, you pay us, and they will unlock it. So the hospital was given this choice. Do they put patients at risk, or do they unlock these medical records and make a payment to the hackers? They made a payment to the hackers. So what's going to happen is more of these attacks are going to happen because you're going to put hospitals in these untenable positions where either they put their patients at risk or they make a payment to the hackers to access uh, these, these records. You have now law firms being attacked. You have police departments being attacked. You have all sorts of folks being attacked. Uh, and then the hackers ask uh, for a ransom. Uh, so uh, I've um, worked with other colleagues. We've written letters to the FBI to get more information on this thing known as ransomware. We want to know uh, what steps can be taken to, to, uh, to mitigate this. Uh, but again, the first step is for all of you who are in the private sector uh, to just increase your cybersecurity defenses and to train your employees uh, to try to be better uh, at not being victims of social engineering. Uh, so let me now sort of conclude, uh, now that I, I've scared you, uh, to <laughs> conclude on a more positive uh, note. Um, I'm incredibly hopeful for America. Uh, we are still the most exceptional, amazing country in the world. And if you look at the other countries in the world, right, who, who here thinks Europe is ever going to compete with America? Or Russia, right? Russia's GDP is smaller than California's. If you look at China, uh, they have poisoned large tracts of land in that country. They don't have the natural resources, the incredible natural resources that the United States has. Our workers uh, are the most efficient workers in the world. We have amazing innovation. Uh, we are poised to win the 21st century. We just need to make sure that we educate our children and return our adults to take advantage of the 21st century economy. Um, but I am very hopeful about this country, about California, about the South Bay. So with that, thank you for inviting me and look forward to working with all of you. Just on behalf of the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the board and our sponsors, we want to present Congressman Liu with this uh, uh, small token of our appreciation for being with us on Thank this you. great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Congressman Liu, for being with us today and, and for sharing uh, those insights and, and for uh, scaring us all half to death on <laughs> how to deal with our mobile phones, but uh, important information, so thank you. Now I have the honor of inviting uh, Jeff Dill to join me on stage. He's the president of PBF Energy Western Re Region, and he will be introducing our uh, second keynote speaker, Congresswoman uh, Waters. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I spoke to Mayor Fury yesterday. He asked me to extend his uh, appreciation and regards to both our congressional uh, guests today. I, I have to say it really is uh, an absolute privilege uh, and honor to introduce probably one of the most esteemed members of Congress today, uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. I, I can tell you I personally appreciate uh, and admire some of the bold stances she's taken recently on some of today's really most compelling issues. I could probably talk all afternoon uh, about her many, many accomplishments. Don't worry, I, I will not do that. Um, I do want to go through some of her uh, accomplishments in Congress and information about her background so you can gain uh, the same appreciation I have uh, for the work she's done and uh, her determination in her office. 
Uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters is considered by many to be one of the most powerful women in American politics today. She has gained a reputation as a fearless and outspoken advocate for women, children, people of color, and the poor. She was just elected in November 2016 to her 14th term in the U.S. House of Representatives in the 43rd Congressional District of California. She represents a large part of the South Central Los Angeles area, Westchester, Playa del Rey, and Watts, and the unincorporated areas of LA County comprised of Lenox, West Athens, West Carson, Harbor Gateway, and El Camino Village. Her district also includes the diverse cities of Gardena, Hawthorne, Inglewood, Lawndale, Lomita, and the great city of Torrance. An integral member of Congressional Democratic leadership, Congresswoman Waters serves as a member of the Steering and Policy Committee. She is also a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and member and past chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Prior to Congress, she served for 14 years in the California State Assembly, where she rose to the powerful position of Democratic Caucus Chair. She was responsible for some of the boldest legislation in California, including the largest divestment of state pension funds from South Africa, landmark affirmative action legislation, the nation's first statewide child abuse prevention training program, the prohibition of police strip searches for nonviolent misdemeanors, and the introduction of the nation's first plant closure law. As a National Democratic Party leader, Congresswoman Waters has been highly visible in Democratic Party politics and has served on the Democratic National Committee since 1980. She was a key leader in five presidential campaigns. In 2001, she was instrumental in the DNC's creation of the National Development and Voting Rights Institute and the appointment of Mayor Maynard Jackson as its chair. Following the Los Angeles civil unrest in 1992, Congresswoman Waters faced the nation's media and public to interpret the hopelessness and despair in cities across America. Over the years, she has brought many government officials and policymakers to her district to appeal for more resources. Following the unrest, she founded Community Build, the city's grassroots rebuilding project. She has used her skill to shape public policy and deliver the goods. $10 billion in Section 108 loan guarantees to cities for economic and infrastructure development, housing and small business expansion. $50 million appropriation for Youth Fair Chance Program which established an intensive job and life skills training program for unskilled, unemployed youth, expanded U.S. debt for Africa and other developing nations, created a center for women's veterans, and I can tell you recently she also did uh, remarkable work in ensuring a sustainable future for the Export-Import Bank, uh, which I think is a very important uh, cog in our local economy, uh, given our proximity to uh, foreign trade. Congresswoman Waters was the founding member and former chair of the Out of Iraq Congressional Caucus. Formed in June 2005, the Out of, Ra Out of Iraq Congressional Caucus was established to bring the, into Congress an ongoing debate about the war in Iraq and the administration's justifications for the decision to go to war and to urge the return of U.S. service members and their families as soon as possible. Maxine Waters was born in St. Louis, Missouri. I spent some of my youth uh, in St. Louis, Missouri as well. Uh, the fifth of 13 children reared by a single mother. She began working at age 13 in factories and segregated restaurants. After moving to Los Angeles, she worked in garment factories and at the telephone company. She attended Cal State LA, she earned a Bachelor of Arts degree and then began her public service as a teacher and a volunteer coordinator in the Head Start program. She is married to Sidney Williams, the former U.S. Ambassador to the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. She's the mother of two children and two grandchildren. Maxine Waters.
I want to thank you, Jeffrey, for that very kind and lengthy <laughs> introduction. Let me start by thanking Chairman Jonathan Butler, President and CEO Donna Duperon, and the entire Torrance Area Chamber of Commerce for the invitation to address you today. And before I go any further, let me just say to Donna, who's not in the room, where is she? There she is over there. I want to thank you uh, for the friendship you have extended to me since I took this part of my district in, in the reapportionment. But I really want to thank you for the way that you worked with me to try and save the XM Bank and the work that the Chamber did here to help with that. Would you give Donna Duperon a big round of applause? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the roles that Chambers of Commerce play throughout the country are essential. And I have a great appreciation for all of the Chambers in our region. I would also like to recognize my friend and colleague, Congressman Ted Liu. And I want to say to him, Thank you for scaring us half to death. <laughs> he is so knowledgeable about cybersecurity, and we're all going to have to learn more about how we protect ourselves. I know that I say to many of my friends and relatives, we have no more privacy, but we cannot conclude that. We have to conclude that we must take every step possible uh, to have privacy. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story, and I'm going to tell it to you really quick. I was on the floor of Congress uh, a week ago, and I was uh, on the floor because there was a bill that had been put on the floor by Chairman Hintelin. I'm the ranking member of the Financial Services Committee, and he's the chair. And they had a bill on the floor. It was about benefit analysis. And basically, that is used uh, by those who are opposed to the SEC and all of the tough work that they have to do to protect investors. So they try to stop them. They try to make it very hard for them to do their job, even though they are a cop on the block. And so I was opposing the benefit analysis bill. And um, I was talking about Russia. And I was talking a little bit about our president-elect. And I was hacked on the floor of the Congress of the United States, RT came on, the Russian television, and blocked me out and stayed up for 10 minutes. And of course, we start getting all of these calls, and my staff was going wild, and we call C-SPAN, because C-SPAN is responsible uh, for our coverage on the floor. They didn't know what had happened, they tried to find out if it was a malfunction of some kind, et cetera. And even today, we don't know what happened. That RT could literally interrupt a speech on the floor of Congress and stay up for uh, 10 minutes. And so, if you're worried about your telephone, worry about everything. Because I want you to know we're being hacked not only on our telephones, but we just experienced it on the floor of Congress. And so it's kind of scary. And uh, I was just told by Jonathan, and asked rather, did I plan on going to Moscow anytime soon? <laughs> and I didn't have time to tell him, I don't really think so. Uh, but anyhow, I thought I'd share that with you since we had gotten such a wonderful lesson from Ted about cyber security. Thank you, Ted. Give him another round of applause. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have to tell you that there's a lot going on in Washington right now. And it's kind of hard to know where to start, but I, like Ted, decided that I was going to focus uh, my remarks in three areas. And so you're going to hear more about the ACA and about Obamacare, as it is commonly known, than you're going to want to know about. I'm going to talk about it toward the end of my presentation, but for the next few months, you're going to be hearing all about the ACA and healthcare. It is a huge issue as we determine where this country is going. 
uh, with health care. So let me start with housing. The 2008 housing crisis took a painful toll. No, I'm not going to start there. Ted, you got me in trouble. I got to introduce my husband, <laughs> Ambassador Sidney Williams. <laughs> I didn't want to leave here and have him say, well, Ted introduced his wife. Why didn't you introduce me? <laughs> and so let me just go back. The 2008 housing crisis took a painful toll on American families, causing significant and long-term shifts in the housing market as families continue to increasingly delay home ownership and rely on rental housing. But construction of new rental housing, particularly affordable rental housing, is nowhere close to keeping up with the demand, which is driving the cost of renting up. This competition is particularly harmful uh, for low and moderate households, income households, who rely disproportionately on rental housing. Meanwhile, home prices are slowly picking up, which is a sign of our economic recovery, but with the cost of a down payment for a home increasingly and rental costs eating up a larger share of family budgets. It is becoming harder and harder for families to save enough for a down payment. The impacts of these housing challenges nationwide are felt even more acutely here in the greater Los Angeles area. For example, the vacancy rates across the country are very low, illustrating tight housing markets, but they are disproportionately low throughout our entire region. In Torrance, we have a 1.2% home ownership vacancy rate and a 3.1 rental vacancy rate. Palos Verdes home ownership vacancy rate is 0.9% and rental vacancy rate of 1.3. In Redondo Beach, home ownership vacancy rate is 2.2 and rental vacancy rate of 2.9. Manhattan Beach, home ownership vacancy rate of 0.3 and rental vacancy rate of 4.1. In Inglewood, home ownership vacancy rate 0.5 and rental vacancy rate of 1.0. In Hawthorne, home ownership vacancy rate of zero and rental vacancy rate of 3.1. These statistics highlight the lack of inventory available for renters as well as aspiring homeowners. Evelyn Arnold is in the room who is one of the leaders in uh, real estate, and she knows exactly what I'm talking about, and she's in Washington very often walking the halls with her colleagues to get us to deal with some of the ways that we could help people get into home ownership, et cetera, et cetera. As a result of a tight rental market, we're seeing an increasing gap between wages and the cost of renting across our country. But in the greater Los Angeles area, we have the biggest gap of all major areas, meaning that renting in Los Angeles area is becoming more and more unaffordable for the average income household. Nationwide, 49% of rental households are housing cost burdened, meaning that they pay over 30% of their income on rent. In Torrance, 55% of renters are cost burdened. In Palos Verdes, 58% of renters are cost burdened. And in Hawthorne and Inglewood, 65% of renter households are cost burdened. Home ownership is increasingly out of reach in the greater Los Angeles area as our housing market continues to recover from the housing crisis. While the medium home value in US is 296,400, the median home value in Torrance is a whooping 713,000. Palos Verdes, 968,200. Redondo Beach, 736,100. Manhattan Beach, 1,400. Hawthorne, 465,700. And Inglewood, 385,900. This means that the cost of a down payment is rising, keeping home ownership rates in Los Angeles low. 
While the home ownership rate nationally is 65%, it is only 56% in Torrance, only 49.9% in Redondo Beach, and only 27% in Hawthorne, and only 37% in Inglewood. In short, Certainly, affordable housing opportunities are nowhere to be found for millions of households in this country, including far too many households right here in Torrance and surrounding cities. Moreover, as our population ages, the housing security of our elderly population is of growing importance, and our housing stock is unprepared to meet the needs of a growing senior population. According to a study from Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies, the nationwide population of 65 to 74 year olds is projected to climb from 21.7 million in 2010 to 32.8 million in 2020, and then to 38.6 million in 2030. The study also points out that much of the nation's existing housing inventory lacks basic accessibility features preventing older adults with disabilities from living safely and comfortably in their homes. Despite these challenges, we have reason to be optimistic. Cities like Torrance have recognized the importance of these housing issues and have made important progress, particularly when it comes to senior housing. Torrance has prioritized the building of more senior housing after determining that the demand for assisted living centers was starting to outpace the existing supply. Here in Torrance, uh, we've also made, Torrance has made it a priority to address veteran homelessness. In fact, in the area, in this entire region, we have all of our cities and localities working to do what they can about homeless veterans. In fact, I was very pleased to attend the grand opening of Vermont Villas about a year ago, a 79-unit development in Harbor Gateway that provides housing for formerly homeless veterans as well as formerly, formerly homeless seniors. This development was financed with a combination of low-income housing tax credits and private investment and involved effective partnerships between government, private, and nonprofit organizations. This kind of progress is so important because it honors the contributions of those who have fought bravely for our country, and it caters to the housing needs of our most vulnerable residents. And so, these are the kinds of efforts that have helped the South Bay Harbor area communities reduce veteran homelessness. And I must do a shout out uh, because the organization here, the South Bay Coalition to End Homelessness, is on it. They have paid attention, they have worked on homelessness, and they have done a great job here. And I'm going to show you what has happened. Here in the South Bay Harbor area, these communities have, been, have reduced veteran homelessness by a dramatic 35 percent between 2015 and 2016. In fact, this decrease has brought the South Bay Harbor area communities much closer to functionally ending veteran homelessness with an estimated 37 homeless veterans still in the area, down from 575 in 2015. Give them a big round of applause. That's something to be very proud of. But there's more work to be done as the overall rate of homelessness in the South Bay Harbor area increased by 22% between 2015 and 2016. And as I have said time and time again, even if it's only one of our veterans living on the streets, that's one too many and that's unacceptable. Thank you. We need to harness the success of these positive stories to continue to push local, state, and federal lawmakers to prioritize investment into affordable housing. But it will not be easy. Not only is the scope of the challenge tremendous for all of the reasons I've discussed, but we have major political battles to fight in Congress to continue to make efforts to cut 
critical housing programs and undermine the mission of the Department of Housing and Urban Development is something that we are very aware of. Ladies and gentlemen, I pay a lot of attention, attention to this area because I'm the ranking member of the House Financial Services Committee and I will continue to present solutions and fight for the funding and reforms that we need to, to meet these challenges head on. So with that, um, I'm just going to mention to you that because of what happened in 2008 with the subprime meltdown and the recession, almost depression, that we had, we came up with some reforms that are known as the Dodd-Frank reforms. And so I have the responsibility to try and help implement these reforms. Now these reforms are not appreciated, are not liked uh, by many in our society. When you hear a lot of talk about Wall Street, you have to understand that what we're doing in these reforms will literally take money out of their pockets, and they are not happy about that. And so I'm constantly challenging some of the biggest financial institutions in this country about their practices. We learned a lot as we fought through that crisis about um, how many folks get tricked into signing on the dotted line for mortgages they can't afford. We had, um, we had mortgages that were not absolutely vetted where uh, people said, you know, they didn't need to know that much about your income. Uh, we had a lot of fraud that went on where people helped folks to make up income uh, so that they could give them those mortgages. They came up with all of these exotic products, uh, no down payment, interest only, and on and on and on. And it put a lot of homeowners in terrible shape. Uh, thousands lost their homes in many areas of this country. And Dodd-Frank is designed uh, to not allow that ever to happen again, along with some other portions of Dodd-Frank, like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is central to the reforms that we're doing. Uh, because what happened, uh, during this crisis is all of our oversight agencies that were supposed to be not only looking out for uh, the safety uh, in our systems, uh, they were supposed to be looking out for consumers, but nobody was taking care of consumers. And now we have this Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that's returned millions of dollars, billions now, I think it's $11 billion, back uh, to consumers that were victims of fraud, being cheated in so many ways, whether it's automobile dealers, uh, 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 payday loans, you name it. And so his name is Mr. Cordray. You'll hear a lot about him because they're after him. They're gonna get him, they want him out. Uh, you say he has too much power, uh, and he does. He's the single director of uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and it was, organized in that fashion so that he wouldn't have to go before the Appropriations Committee and they would tie him up and not give the appropriations that's needed for him to do his job, or they didn't want a single director. They want a commission uh, that could tie his hands. And so when we did the Dodd-Frank uh, legislation, we made sure that he was protected and that has not set well with Wall Street and a lot of other very special interests. And so you're gonna hear a lot about Dodd-Frank, you're gonna hear a lot about Cardre and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And I want you to listen very carefully because some of these issues are not paid attention to. And a lot of people don't know where their harm and their hurt is coming from. And so I want you to pay attention so that you will be able to join in whatever struggles there are to ensure that the citizens of this country are treated fairly and that they're not ripped off and that we get rid of fraud and people don't have to suffer because nobody's looking out for them. A little bit about transportation, it's a little bit better story. I'm proud to report that about one year ago, Congress passed a bipartisan, multi-year transportation bill to bring our nation's transportation system into the 21st century. The bill was called Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, or the FAST Act. For short, H.R. 22 
in the 114th Congress. The final conference report passed the House in December of 2015 by an overwhelming bipartisan vote of 359 to 65, and then it was signed into law by President Obama. See, for those who say there's no partisan work every now and then, it is. The FAST Act provides funding for investments in roads, bridges, and mass transit systems and creates good paying jobs which cannot be outsourced. The final conference report for the bill provides $281 billion in guaranteed funding for highway, bridge, public transit, and transportation safety over five years. Although this conference report was not perfect and I did not agree with every provision, I voted in favor of it because I believe it is important that we move forward with a multi-year transportation program that will repair our dilapidated infrastructure and invest in safe, reliable roads, bridges, and transit systems. Among other provisions, the FAST Act provides almost $1.5 billion for the Successful Transportation Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act program, which helps transit agencies like Metro arrange financing for new investments in transportation infrastructure. Metro used this loan to accelerate the construction of the Crenshaw LAX corridor one of them, a light uh, rail project that will improve transit access for several communities in my district, including the city of Inglewood. Furthermore, the FAST Act also provides $3.7 billion over five years specifically for bus and bus facilities programs. This is a 75% increase over the previous funding level. The increase is especially beneficial for local transit agencies that serve the South Bay, including Metro. Torrance Transit in the city of Torrance and the G-Trans in the city of Gardena. Last October, Metro received 10.5 million federal bus grant which was specifically designated for use in the South Bay region. Metro will use this grant to replace approximately 30 agent, aging diesel buses with new low emission compressed natural gas buses. Last year, I wrote to the Department of Transportation to Secretary Anthony Fox to express my strong support for this grant. I'm proud to have helped Metro obtain federal funding for this note noteworthy project. And I'm especially proud that these new clean fuel buses will be used here in the South Bay. Moreover, I'm working closely with Torrance Transit and Gardena G-Trans to ensure that they too receive their fair share of federal transportation funding. Congress also renewed funding for the Tiger Transportation Grant Program in fiscal year 2016 in response to a letter I wrote the previous year to congressional leaders that was signed by 145 of my colleagues. In March of last year, I wrote another letter to congressional leaders supporting President Obama's request for $1.25 billion for Tiger in funding year 2017, and 137 of my colleagues signed that letter. Almost a year has passed, unfortunately, and there's some in Congress who have still not completed work on the federal funding for government programs in fiscal year 2017. However, when they do, I, along with Ted Lieu and others, will continue to advance full funding for transportation programs that benefit our districts. Finally, I'm gonna touch on something that's gonna make a few people in here a little bit upset. But I want you to know I'm monitoring Metro's work in the South Bay. As I'm sure you know, Measure M was passed by the voters in Los Angeles County in the 2016 elections. Measure M was Metro's proposal to levy a sales tax to fund new transportation projects throughout the county. Measure M includes a variety of projects that will eventually benefit the South Bay cities. <laughs> These projects are as follows. 619 million toward the Green Line extension to the Crenshaw Boulevard in Torrance. 250 million toward the I-405 slash 110 high occupancy vehicle connect ramps and interchange improvements. 
51.5 million toward the I-110 express lanes extension south to the I-405, I-110 interchange. 150 million towards the I-405 South Bay curb improvements. 175 million toward the I-105 express lane from the I-105 to the I-605. 347 million toward the airport Metro Connector, also mm -hmm. known as the 96th Street LAX People Mover Station, and two point billion in escalated dollars over the next 40 years in local return revenue for South Bay cities to use for street improvements, pothole repairs, signals, et cetera. Now, being fully aware that the Torrance City Council and South Bay City's Council of Governments were both on record opposing Measure M because they were unhappy about the delayed scheduling of many of these projects. Ted Lou and I intend to work with my South Bay cities and Metro leadership to make sure we receive not only our fair share of the transportation funds raised, but that the project schedules will more adequately reflect an equitable distribution of priorities throughout LA County. So we're gonna work on it, we promise you. Now, I'm not going to go into the Affordable Care Act because I think Ted, you know, talked a lot about it. Again, you are going to hear a lot about this Affordable Care Act. What we have is health care under the Affordable Care Act, referred to as Obamacare, uh, led by President Obama, designed to ensure that all of us, all Americans, have health care coverage. That's what the whole thing is all about. And of course, there are some aspects of it that people just don't like, and there are aspects that people do like. A lot of folks who are opposed to it are for, uh, afraid of the mandate. They don't like the mandate. And without going into a lot of detail about that, let me just say, in order to have affordable care for everybody, we've all got to chip in. It's not that it can work if only a few people are involved in this health care plan. And so that's one of the issues that will be debated uh, as we talk about this affordable care. Um, there are some other aspects of it. Well, I'll just mention again, and Ted did mention it, that we are all very pleased about um, not only being able to keep our children, and I say children up to age 26, on our health care plans. And why is this so important? Because our children are graduating from college with a lot of debt. And they can't get the jobs that they want oftentimes. They're not making the amount of money they thought they were going to make after they graduated. And they can't get married as soon as they want to and have children and buy a house and all of that. The last thing they're thinking about is insurance because they think they're invincible anyway. And so we're pleased uh, that we're able to keep them on. And the other aspect that we are so very pleased about, and most people are, is the fact that you cannot be turned down because of pre-existing conditions. Do you know how many people have died uh, because they could not get health care coverage? And you know, we all know people with everything from cancer to heart disease, high blood pressure, you name it. In our families, in our neighborhoods, we have been haunted with diseases that people could not afford to have insurance coverage for. And so mostly everybody likes that. Even the president elect who wants to get rid of the ACA said he liked that aspect of it. But of course we don't know what he's gonna say tomorrow. <laughs> it may change. But let me just say that we're gonna wrestle with this. As Ted said, while there are those who are talking about repealing it, they have not come up with anything better. They have not come up with anything. And so it's not easy to throw all of this out, but maybe there are some ways that there can be uh, some coming together around something that would see us still in the position of being able to provide comprehensive health care for all Americans, and at the same time, it's affordable, 
and at the same time, the premiums don't keep rising so high uh, that uh, we get angry and want to get out of the system. Uh, the way that it is organized, and particularly in California, covered California, has really the best of all of the states. And they ensure, as they balance what is paid by young people and older people, that they can get younger people into the system as quickly as they possibly can. And they pay maybe a little bit less. And some of uh, us old, I mean, you older folks, <laughs> some of us older folks pay a little bit more. And I think that's fair, because you know after a certain age, all kinds of things start to happen. <laughs> things that nobody warned you about. They didn't tell you it was going to happen. And all of a sudden, you're wondering, why didn't somebody just clue me that after a certain age, these strange things were going to start to happen? So we pay a little bit more. We want more of the young people in, et cetera, et cetera. And so I want you to pay attention to this, because you're going to have to make some decisions about what you support. You're going to have to decide what makes good sense for you, your families, and your communities. With that, I'm not going to say much more about affordable care and covered California. I want to end similar uh, to Ted Lou uh, to talk about uh, the fact that we do live in the most wonderful country in the world. We live in a democracy. And when you see some of us fighting about being hacked, about elections being interfered with, it is because that's an attack on our democracy. And we don't plan to allow anybody to undo what has been developed in this country for justice and equality for all. We're going to fight for that. And so having said that, we all have the responsibility to ensure that we're participating in the democracy. It is not that you send someone to Washington and they're going to get it all done. We're nothing without your support. It's not that somebody else is going to do it for you. If you don't belong to something in your community, something's wrong with you. And I want to thank Torrance, because Torrance is well organized. Torrance has more organizations and more ribbon cuttings than any other city. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it, because on the business side, if you come into Torrance as a new business, you're going to get welcome. You're going to, you know, get the ribbon cutting. But if you decide five years later that you're going to expand, we're going to come back and we're going to cut another ribbon. <laughs> and if you decide you're going to open up a second store, we're going to be over there. And if it's a restaurant and you got food to eat, we're going to eat your food. <laughs> and we're going to have a good time. Uh, but the other thing about Torrance is this. The education system and the schools in Torrance are good. And we've got to make sure that we involve ourselves in our schools and in education so that it continue to be one of the best school districts in America. That's extremely important. When Ted talks about cybersecurity, uh, and we talk about STEM, we talk about STEM education, science and engineering, et cetera, our kids got to be educated or they're not going to be in it. They've got to be educated so that not only can they develop systems and they can create new ways by which we have privacy and we protect ourselves, but they've got to move the world forward. Aren't you proud of SpaceX and Hawthorne? That's in my district. They just had a new launch and it was successful. And so we should be proud not only of this region, but proud of this country. And we should belong to something, whether it is involved, you're involved in the schools, or whether you're involved in business, or whether you're involved in just going to the city council and making them mad at you because you're accusing them of something they did or did not do. <laughs> I see that our city council members are here. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> and so with that, um, let us not be driven apart because sometimes we disagree. Uh, let us try and understand the other person's point of view.
and let's talk to each other. My telephone in my district office is available. It's open all the time, eight hours a day. Call me. I have a habit of calling people back who call me to curse me out. I call them back. I don't curse them out, but I wish I could. <laughs> but I thank them for calling me. And then they're so surprised. They said, is this really Maxine Waters? I said, in person, this is her. And so we talk, and then you'd be surprised how the conversation changes. And it really does. Having said all of that, let me just conclude by saying, if you see me on television saying something you don't like, call me and ask me why I said it or what's driving that, and I'll be happy to talk with you. In the final analysis, I'm not at the inauguration to, you know, tomorrow. Ted Lou's not there either. I'm not going to be in this by myself. <laughs> but I want you to know, <laughs> For every constituent in my district who asked for tickets, and they had granted us 176 tickets, I covered everybody who wanted to go and who called and asked. We made sure they got their tickets. And for uh, you know, handicapped or older people or what have you are challenged, they got the few seating ones that we had. And then we got the best standing areas that we could possibly have. Just because there are people who I gave tickets to who don't agree with me would never stop me from sharing with them and allowing them the opportunity to be in Washington, D.C. It's a good place to be sometimes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>